invite you to open a Bible to Psalm chapter 23 as we go through this beloved poem and prayer that is a reminder of who our God is. Um, using it because it's, it's familiar to many of us, even if you don't have much of a church background. People have heard of Psalm 23. It's, it's read a lot, used a lot to provide comfort to our hearts. And the whole point over the coming weeks is to answer for us the question of who is Jesus? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gathers his disciples together and he asks them the question of who do people say that I am? And they give all kinds of answers that the crowds have been saying that Jesus was a prophet, he was a teacher, he was a really good miracle worker. And then Jesus looks at the disciples and asks them the personal question of, but who do you say that I am? And the reality is that that's the most important question for our lives as human beings. It's the most important question for our faith as Christians is, who do we say that Jesus is? Because as we talk about faith and church and worship and all these things, or as, or as people in our lives ask us, why is it so important to you? What does it mean to you? Why do you go to worship and church and all those things that come along with it? The easy answer of we're in church because of peer pressure is to say, Jesus, it's all about Jesus. But the reality of life is that we're very good as human beings about making our lives and our, even our faith about all kinds of other things. We get very distracted. We give different kinds of answers about, oh, it's about these morals. It's about these ethics. It's about behaving a certain way. If we're really obnoxious, it becomes about voting a certain way. And it becomes about winning arguments. It becomes about judging other people. And all of these things begin to get attached to it, right? And you don't have to just take my word for it. You can talk to people that you know in your life and ask them, well, what do you think about Christians or the church or Christianity? And I just want you to take a while to see how long that list is before they get to the name Jesus. Because it's not always the first thing that people immediately sh shout out, right? And sometimes it's because of our own forgetfulness. We, we as human beings, as Christians, we get distracted and we begin to, through our actions or our words, send a message out into the world that, oh, it's about Jesus, you know, sometimes, but a lot of other times it's about all these other things. So when Jesus asked the disciples this question of who do you say that I am, Peter speaks on behalf of the group and he says, you are the Christ, meaning you are the Messiah, you are the Savior, the Son of the living God. So Peter's answer is, here's who Jesus is, that he is the Savior and that he is the Son of God. And so as we give that answer to the world, because that's the answer that the world needs to hear, that who is Jesus? What is this faith all about? What is Christianity all about? The answer being, well, it's about Jesus. The question becomes, well, who is Jesus then, right? Okay, he's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. What does that mean? And so Psalm 23 gives us this wonderful picture of who our God is, who Jesus is, and, and what he does for us. And the first line of Psalm 23 is, the Lord is my shepherd. And so in John chapter 10, Jesus declares, he's the good shepherd who loves his sheep. And the good news of the gospel that we talked about last week is that Jesus loves everybody. Even the people you don't like. How many of you have a list of people you don't like? Show of hands. Who wants to be honest in church this morning? And you're like, yeah, I could name some names right now. All right, and some of it's leaning on a little more than just disliking them, <laughs> like really want bad things, right? Here's the, the good news of how great the shepherd's love is. He loves even the people that we don't like, that we don't think deserve to be liked or loved. And the good news of the way that Jesus speaks about the, the good news of the gospel is that he says he loves all the sheep. He says he loves the found sheep, the people that, that are part of his flock, that are part of the church, that know him and believe in him. And he also says he loves the lost sheep. They haven't quite figured out who Jesus is yet. They don't understand everything. They haven't placed their faith. But Jesus says he still loves them. So the way Jesus looks at the world, looks at all people, is with this great heart of love that says, I love all of you. You're all my sheep. You all belong to me. Some of you are found and have received forgiveness and redemption and salvation. 
and some of you are lost, but his heart says that he loves everybody. So in verse 3, which is what we are looking at this morning, it says things about what does this shepherd do for us. In verse 2, he gives us the things that we need for life. In verse 3, it says he restores my soul. And this is my favorite line in Psalm 23. Right? It's a question of, well, who is Jesus? Well, he's a good shepherd. What does the good shepherd do? In verse 2, it says he gives us what we need for life as his sheep. Verse 3 says, he restores my soul, which is this wonderful message of comfort and rest for everybody who's ever been tired. Anybody ever been tired? Anybody ever woken up tired? <laughs> Isn't that fun? You're like, oh, what a good night's sleep. Why am I still tired? Now, there's that kind of tired, right? There's the physical tired. You're struggling to get sleep, and you're just a little worn out. Maybe you've been sick or whatnot. But what Psalm 23 is talking about with the restoring of our souls is we all know that there's a different kind of tired, right? There's the, I need a nap. I need an extra hour of sleep to hit the snooze button kind of tired. And there's the tired where we're just worn out in life, right? We're, we're just kind of tired of one thing happening after another, right? And you, anybody know what I'm talking about? You kind of feel it in your bones and your soul, and you're just like, Ugh. maybe it's a couple bad things are happening or there's grief happening and sorrow, and it's all kind of building up, and it feels like I, I could use some rest. And someone goes, well, take a nap. You're like, not that kind of rest, but I need rest for my heart and my soul, right? I, I need it to be cared for. And Jesus says, this is who he is. He's the good shepherd who restores our souls. Now, here's why this is such wonderful, good, restful, peaceful news for you and me. Life is exhausting. Right? You get tired. Anybody ever said, I'll catch up on sleep later? And like a few decades pass, you're like, well, you know, maybe, maybe later's never coming. Right? And you get worn out. And then sometimes there's those, those very long, heavy seasons of life that just weigh on our hearts and souls. And we're like, oh, okay, God, when, when's the peace coming? When's the rest coming? And he makes this wonderful promise. This is what he does. It's not something that he might get around to. Psalm 23 says it with absolute certainty that this is exactly what he does. He is the restorer of my soul. But life isn't just exhausting because things happen to us. Life can be exhausting because we, we make it that way. And the same thing can happen to our faith life, our relationship with God, where we are always going and going and going. How many of you are always doing something and you love to brag about it? I'm busy, right? You ever been to a party and you ask people, how are you doing? What's the number one answer? I'm busy, I'm tired, right? Why are you tired? Because I'm busy, right? And we're doing this, we're going, and we're going because we always get the next thing done. We always got to get to the next activity. Anybody have a calendar? Some of you don't? Okay, good. You're just living life as it comes. That's, that's great. We're happy for you. The rest of us have calendars. Anybody ever looked at your calendar before any of the events happen? and just felt tired on the inside. You just, you turn the page, and you're like, ah, oh, why is that month happening? Anybody ever done that? You're, just, you're like, oh, well, here it is. And we just keep going, and we're going, and we're going. We're just tired. We're worn out. We need rest. But here's the tricky thing. It doesn't just happen with the activities in life and our work and our busy schedules. It oftentimes happens with our souls. And here's what I mean by that. It happens with our relationship with God. We, we get into this attitude, this idea, this way of thinking that says, I've got to keep doing more for Jesus. I've got to keep doing more for God. Now, good things are good. Right? There's all kinds of Bible verses and commands from God about how to love people and serve them and care for them. But the problem as human beings is we get the order wrong. 
we think and we believe this trap that Satan tempts us with is that in order to keep God on my side, to keep him happy or pleased with me, to keep him blessing my life or answering my prayers, as a pastor, that's the one I've seen a lot where people come and pastor, I've been praying a lot. You know, I feel like God hasn't answered me yet, but I've been, I've been doing really good. So I'm, I think he'll come around and answer my prayer pretty soon. Right? We, we live in this way where we're, we begin to think, I got to keep God happy. I got to keep pleasing him. Otherwise, he'll stop being for me. He'll stop being with me. He'll stop loving me or caring for me or he'll punish me. Right? We live in this mentality of fear. And what happens is you go and you go and you go. Why? I think, well, I got to keep God happy. I, I got to make sure he, he's never disappointed in me. I got to make sure that I'm always pleasing him and doing the right things. And the reason we fall for that, Luther says, is because the gospel is the most difficult thing in the whole world for us to believe and trust in. Because the way our minds work, the way the world works is you've got to perform, right? Even in our human relationships, we feel like I've got to perform, I've got to keep doing the right things to keep people happy. But when we teach ourselves to think of God that way, when we live in our relationship with God where it's this treadmill of just doing the next good thing and, and keeping going and keeping going because we think we're earning God's favor, or we think it'll make God happier with us. Or I had a friend one time who was a brand new Christian, and his whole attitude for over a year before I finally got into his brain was, well, if you just do the good things the Bible says, everything will work out. God will take care of it. Now, that sounds really simplistic, and some of you are like, well, I grew up Lutheran, so I know that's not true. Okay, that's wonderful news. But you're a human being, and we all kind of begin to fall into that trap. Of if I just do the right thing, you know, if I, if I just get life back on track, if I, if I kind of get rid of these things in my life and add these things in my life and start, then God will be what? Be happy with me. He'll love me. He'll, he'll, he'll bless me. So some of you know that I'm weird, right? We've accepted this. Okay, when I was in college, I really struggled with my relationship with God. It was just always this back and forth of, man, sometimes I feel like God loves me as his child, and boy, isn't that amazing. And then I would flip back to this attitude and this struggle of, he wants nothing to do with me. Look how much of a hypocrite and terrible person I am. And so what I did... Please don't do this. This is a negative example, okay? <laughs> what I did was I began to keep a journal of all the things that I felt guilty about, the things that I felt like were wrong. Now, if I was more accurate, it would have been a much longer list. These are just the things I was aware of and could remember, right? I'm sure I did more sins, okay? <laughs> But I was keeping this list. And then what I did in order to make sure that I felt like God actually loved me and wouldn't abandon me is I would keep a list on the opposite page of my journal of all the good things I'd done. To, and I would draw lines like this one makes up for this one. So please don't do that. I'm begging you. Now, it's probably not a risk for most of you. Okay, because I'm weird, and that was psychotic. Okay, don't do it. Okay. <laughs> but I do wonder, because as a pastor, counsel a lot of people, a lot of times we keep internal lists, right? We feel guilty. Maybe we feel ashamed. Anybody ever had someone else tell you that they forgive you? Anybody been forgiven? It's wonderful, right? And then you still felt like you needed to pay them back? right? Sometimes we do the same thing. We are like, oh yeah, pastor announced to us absolution, right? You, we have a time where you confessed your sins. And I said, Jesus forgives you. 
And sometimes we believe in our hearts, well, that's true, I'm free. And other times, anybody ever gotten up from the kneeler and been like, yeah, but I feel like I still owe him, right? So sometimes we keep these internal lists of, I've got to make it up, I've got to do these good things, I've got to please God. You know what happens when you do that kind of faith, and you live that kind of way? It's exhausting. You don't just need a nap, right? You, you get worn out in your soul. You lose your joy of like, right? Oh, can't wait to worship. And if you're living that way, though, guess what's the thing you don't want to do? Go to church. Why? Oh, it's just gonna, I'm going to hear the things I'm not doing right. And so the question is, well, but who's Jesus? See, that, that's a picture of Jesus that we create, right? That's a picture that Satan deceives us into believing is true, that, oh, he is this God who is waiting for us to make up for our mistakes. He, he's waiting for us to do enough good things to please him, to always keep him happy, and he's threatening us that if we don't do enough, he's going to back away. He's going to tell us we're not good enough anymore. And we get exhausted and we're worn out and we're searching for some peace and hope and we do another good thing like, oh, that didn't do it. <laughs> we're doing that. that didn't do it. And here's the good news of Psalm 23. It says, here's who Jesus is. He's the good shepherd who restores your soul. He's the one that, that puts you back together, who gives you peace and hope in those heavy moments. He's the one who gives you rest when you're worn out on the inside so that you can actually rest. You can actually say no. You can actually take a pause and know that even if I'm still, even if I'm not moving, even if my brain is not running a million miles and thoughts a minute, God still loves me. He still holds on to me. He still redeems me and keeps me. Now, the other good thing about this promise, which says he restores our soul, is he's the one doing it. That sounds really simple. When you go to seminary, this is like the first class you take is about how to understand what part is God doing, what part are you doing. And the good news of the gospel is you don't do any of it. Right? That's really good news. You can just take a deep breath right now and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to be okay. Right? If you read Psalm 23, verse 3, it says, he restores my soul. So it's not you going, I've got some problems. <laughs> not everything in life is going the way I want it. I've made mistakes, and now I'm going to put my best foot forward, and I'm going to change my habits. I'm going to come up with a new plan. I'm going to make things right. And then I'm going to get exhausted and worn out. Now, the good news of verse 3 is that it says, he, the good shepherd, Jesus, is the one who restores your soul. Meaning, he's the one that's doing the work for you. Meaning, he's the one that has completely done all the work. And he's the one that is reaching down and raising us up and giving us new life and a breath of fresh air and an ability to actually rest in his grace and mercy and say, I've done enough for you. You don't have to do anymore. You don't have to exhaust yourself. You don't have to wear yourself out. All you have to do is trust in my good grace and mercy for you. Martin Luther in his commentary on Psalm 23 says it this way. It says, the gospel is a blessed word. It demands nothing of us, but announces everything that is good. Namely, that God has given us poor sinners, his only son, and that he is to be our shepherd. I love that reminder. It demands nothing. The good news of who is Jesus is he is your good shepherd. The good news of what does Jesus do for me is that he is the one who restores your soul and he demands nothing from you. He doesn't save you and then go, okay, now spend the rest of your life making it up to me. He doesn't restore your soul and say, now get back on track and do the right things and never make a mistake. He demands nothing. He simply says, I have restored your soul. 
An amazing picture of this is usually read around Good Friday when Jesus is on the cross. Being our good shepherd, dying for, as Luther says, us poor sinners who need our souls restored, who need our lives restored and put back together. And he cries out from the cross, it is finished. Most of you are probably familiar with those words. Now here's the temptation is, I've heard those words a whole bunch of times, right? Been to Good Friday, no, yeah, Jesus, he's on the cross, that's great. And then to leave here and think nothing of it. That's gonna be your temptation, is to walk out those doors, you're gonna shake my hand, some of you will say good job, some of you are gonna ignore me and not make eye contact, right? <laughs> and you're just gonna leave as fast as possible. And no matter what, the temptation is gonna be leaving here and forgetting the words of Jesus from the cross saying, it is finished. Here's what I mean by that. The temptation is going to be walking out here and going, I'm the one that's got to restore my own soul. I'm the one that's got to keep doing the good stuff. I'm the one that's got to keep doing the right things and making sure God is happy. And the good news of the shepherd restoring your soul, being the one who does it for you, not you doing it yourself, is him cried on the cross saying, it is finished, it is complete, it is done, it means there's nothing more that he is demanding of you. There's nothing more that you need to do to please him or earn his love. He loves you perfectly. He has forgiven you perfectly and wholly, meaning all the stuff in your past, the things that you are wrestling with in the pews right now, and the junk you're going to do later in the week. He says, that's already done. I've already forgiven you. I've already done all the work. You don't have to make it up to me anymore. See, this is what faith looks like. Luther says it's trusting in the promises and the word of God. And the promise of Psalm 23 is that the good shepherd restores your soul. He does it all for you. So you can simply rest and go, no matter what happens in my life, no matter what good or bad I do, no matter what circumstances I face, God is always loving me and always for me. And I can simply rest in that promise. I don't have to exhaust myself. Another way of putting it is, you don't actually have to kill yourself to save yourself. Jesus already did that on the cross. And the good news of God's promises and words is that Jesus really meant it on the cross when he said, it is finished. He really meant it for not just the apostles and the disciples and all the saints, he meant it for you right now. It is done. It is finished. All the work for God's love is done for you. He loves you perfect. All the work for God's grace and forgiveness in your life is done for you. He has forgiven you. He will continue to forgive you. All the work for redemption and salvation, as Jesus says, is done. It is finished. So what you and I do as Christians, as his sheep, we just simply celebrate it. We get to enjoy the good news of the gospel. We get to rest in his grace and say, I'm his sheep. No matter what, you belong to him. No matter what, he has forgiven you. No matter what, he has saved you. And as he promises as the good shepherd in John 10, he says, no one and nothing can snatch my sheep out of my hand. So whatever sins and guilt and shame and whatever kind of internal list you have, the good news is you still belong to Jesus. He gives you rest and restoration. He has given you grace and forgiveness and salvation. So my hope and prayer for you as your pastor is that you just take a really deep breath in life and go, it's gonna be okay. I belong to Jesus. He's holding on to me, and no matter what I do, no matter what my life turns into, he's not letting go of you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the good shepherd who restores our souls, that your promise from the cross that it is finished is true for us here and now, even today, that you love us with a perfect love, you forgive us with a perfect forgiveness, that you have done all the work necessary to give salvation to us. As your sheep and as your people, may we rest in that grace and mercy each and every day.
knowing that you are always with us and never letting go of us. In your name we pray. Amen.